What if in about five seconds, every time you make a new piece of content, you could increase the traffic that comes to that piece of content by about 10%. We just did a recent test on this, and it's something that we all know about, but not enough of us are implementing. So in this video, we're gonna help you with titles. This is really fun. We have a weekly digest email that goes out to Project 24 members, and the subject line is normally P24 Weekly Digest, with an average open rate of about 37%. So for this last week, we decided to do a split test. And so some of the audience got an email titled, Project 24 just got way better, finally. And instantly, 9% higher open rate on that email. We went back as well and looked through several of the emails we've sent out to our email list and which ones were sort of outliers and the kind of titles that they got. Check out some of these titles on the screen and you can see clearly why these emails get opened while a lot of the others don't. The same exact principle applies to blog posts and YouTube video posts, Pinterest pins, everywhere that you're putting your content out in front of people. So today we're gonna to talk about some of the things that we're doing with our titles that we've seen to work really well. First thing we need to understand is there are really three different types of titles that we can be creating. One is for a piece of content that is purely informational the second, it has some interest to it, and then a pure interest title. The reason that it's very critical that you understand these three different types of titles is because when we talk about this, when we talk about making more interesting titles, we'll then go back to somebody's blog and we look at their titles and it's like, oh no, this is just not going to work for search because they're using the wrong type of title on a piece of content. So an example of that. Let's say I'm uh, writing about uh, the best water filters or the water filtering pictures, right? Like it's a pretty bland topic. Nobody's like into water filters. Nobody wants to read reviews for an hour. They just want to know what's the best water pitcher with a filter in it, right? This is pretty quick information. And so if I write something really flowery, um, it, it's probably going to do more harm than good. Like if my title is, this is the most amazing water filter I've ever used. It's like, eh, don't annoy me. Just do a quick review and tell me which one is best. And so a lot of posts are just informational and we need the type of title that appeals to somebody who wants quick, pure information. Other things people are searching for, they kind of want to be sold on. If you're looking for a phone review, very few people are going to read one review and be done and go buy it. Usually you're going to research this thing for an hour. You're going to be stuck with this phone for two years, right? And so you want to kind of read into it and get more information and you want to be sold on it. And so a title with some interest is going to be perfect for that kind of audience. Something to add some mystery or intrigue. And then other titles are pure interest. And what we mean by that is, I don't even care if I rank on search for this term. It's just a YouTube video um, that will just go out as cool information in my industry. And YouTube will say, well, this person has been searching about home remodeling. This interest video is about home remodeling. Let's shoot it out to them, right? Or it's for Pinterest or Instagram, etc. It's a post intended for social sharing. Um, and that may not even need to tell the person the topic of the video. So now we're going to talk through each one of those buckets because it is critical that you understand them. And I do think that that's really key to understand. Google doesn't have a way for you to just like, hey, Google, browse through titles from blogs that I'm interested in on topics that I'm in. That's not a feature of Google. But that is exactly how things like Pinterest and YouTube, these social networks, that's exactly how they work. And so kind of a neat trick you can use is like if you have a blog post that you want that kind of title for, you can write a headline that's a little more descriptive that can do well in search. But then on that interest on that um, image that you put out on Pinterest, that's where the super intriguing just interest title goes. So the first one is just that strict information. When we write a response post, in virtually every case, this is the kind of title we go for. And the most important principle for, for these strict information posts, as well as really for the some interest titles, is that the title itself has to be um, appropriately descriptive. It has to have enough information about what's in the post 
that I know exactly what to expect when I click on that title. Okay, so look at these titles. These are great titles for response posts because they're telling the user, yes, I have exactly what you're looking for, but it's also telling them how you're helping them. So an example of this is this title. In fact, today, if you Google YN560 version four, it's a very popular flash for photography. Um, if you search YN560 version four manual, my website, Improved Photography that I used to own, comes up. And the reason this article worked to pop to number one is because I what I added to the subtitle, a helpful illustrated guide. And it ranks above the actual user manual, right? Like when you're Googling YN564 manual, this ranks above the Young Nuo website. Um, just because of that title, it's a helpful user illustrated guide. That's what somebody wants when they're searching for it. And I think that's a really valuable principle is not only being descriptive about what this article is about, but then being descriptive about how you're going to help them. In some cases, it might be a helpful illustrated guide, um, just like you just did there. It could be, hey, with charts, tables, um, or with an infographic or whatever it is. So another example from this list here, you know, this best X for X, an example we could use is like best water filters for cabins, right? And so then you might say speed, life, convenience, and performance, right? And so I'm going, these are some of the criteria that I used to rank which one I think is best. And that way people just have an idea that not only am I just, you know, I'm not just going to Amazon reviews and saying, hey, everybody like this one best. What I did is I actually did a comparison on these bits of criteria. And so that, again, just adds more credibility to your post and makes it a little more interesting to click on even though it's clearly just a highly information-based title and post. Yeah, you're basically just listing out what your subtitles are, what kind yeah. of information you have there. Okay, next we're going into the interest posts. Now, when you have a title that has some kind of interest, intrigue to it, you still have to very carefully identify the search topic because you do want to rank for it but because of the competition that's there, because of the mindset of somebody who's searching for some things, they want something a little bit more sexy. And so we're gonna provide it to them. We used one on you last week on, or two weeks ago on, on YouTube. We used the title, The Surprising Results from Our 2020 Study on Blog Post Length. Now that's a great title for some interest because it's about blog post length. Somebody could search this, right? And you know, what's the best word count for a blog post? How long should a blog post be? And it would very much fit that search. But if we had just titled best word count for blog posts, it's pretty bland. And so somebody who's you know already a subscriber may be like, yeah, maybe we'll skip that one uh, and just move on to the next. We wanted it to have something. And we did have some surprising results from it. And so we wanted to present it that way. There are so many cool titles you can use that have some interest in it, but still match a search. I wanna highlight a couple uh, others that I think are really interesting. The best X for X I've ever tested, but you shouldn't buy one. So this would be, you know, the best camera for sports photographers I've ever tested, but you shouldn't buy one. So that's a perfect, beautiful title, right? Because if I'm searching, you know, best camera for sports photographers, it's definitely gonna show up. But then you see it and it's like, why shouldn't I buy it if it's the best you ever test it? It's adding some interest and intrigue to it that make you that make you click on it. It's about just marketing what you already have. We're not using that title unless it's actually applicable. You know, maybe you tested them and you say, you know, this is the best I've ever tested, but it's just way more expensive than everything else that's 95% as good. And so you can use your title as a way to highlight what you're trying to express in the video. But notice that in some of these other examples, we've implemented some of the principles we talked about with those just purely informational tactics. So like 12 never before seen date ideas. Okay, what I'm telling you is you're gonna get 12 date ideas. They're not the obvious ones that show up on every date idea list. Go on a hot air balloon ride. Yeah, and then I say with photos. So I'm telling you how I'm going to help you. Like in this blog post, 
I'm going to I'm going to give you these ideas and I'm going to give you these photos to help with inspiration. Um, and so you can use those same principles we talked about for those interest posts uh, and their titles to help add a little bit more interest um, to some of these interest titles. There's kind of a spectrum of how much interest to add. And in this case, we want to add a higher level of interest and focus a little bit less on the really specific description of what they're going to get in um, exactly in this post or in this video. Now there are some times where you do not care how a piece of content actually ranks on Google. Sometimes you're only titling it to be interesting. Now in the world of blogging, this basically doesn't exist anymore. Mostly the pure interest content is gone in blogging, unless you're going to post it on Reddit, unless you're going to post it on Pinterest, unless you're going to make it as a YouTube video. But we actually create a lot of this kind of content and we find it's often our best performing when we're using it in the right way on those channels. So here are some titles that you could use. Uh, so let's say you have, you know, a true crime or something YouTube channel. Titling it, she really shouldn't have walked her dog that, that night. Oh, it's beautiful, right? You've got to click on that. You've got to wonder why, what happened, right? And so somebody who isn't even searching or who has done some true crime video searching that Google says, ah, they like this kind of stuff, throwing that out there is just like a guaranteed click. So it's perfect. You see YouTube channels all the time. Oh, it drives me crazy. But how many channels have done my last YouTube video? And then it's like, I'm burned out, guys. I really need a break. I'm going to take seven days off before my next video. They're not really quitting YouTube, right? Um, but they all want to make you, make you think. Now, it's clickbait. It's ugly. I do not recommend it. But you know what? It's working for a lot of people. Um, so we can learn something from it. How one man's invention changed farming forever. Even if I haven't really been searching farming stuff, it could hit entrepreneurship, business, history, farming. A lot of people could be interested in that kind of content. Even if I'm not really searching for what inventions changed farming. You know what I mean? So if you're going to create this kind of stuff, you have to have an audience first even if that audience is a prepackaged one, like I just participate on this Reddit group and I know they would eat this up. I know I'm going to get a few thousand clicks, right? I know this recipe would kill on Pinterest if I title it this and I don't care about Google. So if you have access to that kind of channel and you're ready to make that kind of content, it's beautiful. If you're taking our YouTube course, if you're in Project 24, go through the YouTube course and you'll hear about the source inversion after that source inversion is when you create this kind of content. And that's killer. Um, I'm here and now I'm making puns off of your uh, true crime stuff, but um, <laughs> no, but I think that's really key is that like on a platform like YouTube, this type of content is actually most of the content that does well. Um, it's not about search so much anymore. It's about um, that interest and being found that way um, after you have that initial audience. But we should still give a little bit of a clue, right? This is about inventions and farming, okay? It's, I, I know that it's along those lines, but now there's a lot of mystery surrounding it, like, okay, but what is the invention and how did it change farming forever? It's enough that I'm interested. So find that balance, um, you know, run some of your headline ideas off of other people. Um, look at what works really well on other YouTube channels. What are some of the videos that's really, really pop? And look at their headlines for ideas. You're going to find some things that work really well. And the more you practice this, the better you're going to get at creating just awesome headlines that are going to boost your traffic, boost the clicks substantially. Thanks everybody for joining us in, in this video. And we will see you after our next video, which will be our last. Ha, ha, ha.